first thing, thank you all for coming here. Um, this talk has a catchy title, like down the memory lane, but uh, it could be titled, uh, I broke my system a couple times and I don't want you to go through it, so that's why I made it. Uh, I'll start giving some context so you know where I'm coming from by giving this talk. I go by NIRAV in almost all of the internets. Uh, I'm based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I've been using Elixir since 2015. Uh, coming from a background of mostly Java and C. Uh, started using Elixir in a local startup back there. Uh, being a probably member of the Sao Paulo Elixir meetups, uh, which I'm, I'm now co-organizing. And it's quite fun. We have meetups every month. It's mostly 50 people attending. Uh, the largest one we had was 70, so it's quite cool. Uh, I work remotely for Telnix, which is a company based in Chicago. You might recognize from the sponsors of the, yeah, the conference this year, which is also really cool because the first time I work for a, a company that sponsors the community I like. Uh, and Telnix is a telecommunications company, but it's like a next gen telco. It's registered as a carrier in almost 20 countries and does things in a different way. I'd like say that it's a bottom up company. So it started with uh, telephony infrastructure, it has points of presence all over North America, Europe, Asia. Hopefully next year to have a point of presence in Sao Paulo also. It's all connected by fiber backbone, so it means Tonis has full control of the network, and since it's a registered carrier, it can offer uh, telecommunication services with good quality and affordable pricing. And like I said, it's bottom up, so now we have uh, more high-level services, like the service that I work for uh, with is called Call Control. It's about uh, receiving uh, web hooks and issuing commands for live calls, so you can uh, work that. So it's basically processing events from our telephony engine and issuing commands, and the product is exclusively written in Elixir. So that's where I was at when I started thinking about this talk. I was building this product and I experienced a memory leak. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I would like to talk about this stuff. So start with a bit of context, uh, some things that are often associated with the Bing. So first thing is it's an actor model. So that means we have processes that uh, talk to each other via exchanging messages. And also, those processes are isolated. The only way they exchange information is by exchanging messages. Another thing that's uh, commonly uh, said is about the GC per process, because this is a thing that helps give the platform the soft real-time property, because since it has GC per process, it can continue working with the other ones while it's running GC for a particular one. So basically, it's super scalable. We write the code and run it, and it works, and it's awesome. But that's not the full picture, right? So my goal here is to show some ways you could break your system, which is also some ways I broke systems in the past. But it should be interesting. And well, the first one, I think no talk about how to uh, misbehave or break in applications will be complete without this one is Atom Leaks. I think the canonical example would be to use poison and decode that uh, with keys as atoms. And this is a good code that uh, could be in production uh, any application. Like sometimes you're just consuming a private API, so well, it's fine, you can use that. But in a non-production example, uh, I wrote this. It's a simple function that uh, creates a random string uh, two million times and then uses the string to atom, just so we can see what happens when you run that. So when you run a call like this, what you get is a nice message saying you have no more entries left in your atom table, because in the Bing, all the atoms go to a global table that is never garbage collected. So once you add a new atom, it stays there till the Bing is restarted. And that's why uh, this is a problem. So you can increase the maximum number. Of, uh, I changed this in this example to just uh, 100,000. But I think the, 
the folds a million. But, well, you, you can look at this code and think, well, no one would do that in production. That would never happen. But in reality, uh, there are some implicit atoms that occur. For example, module names. When we were uh, starting back in 2015, we had this really great idea of Haskellizing enums in Elixir. So we wrote a bunch of macros that would create a module for each possible value we could have for enums. So you can easily add up atoms like that. Another one is node names. If you have long living nodes and they connect to different other nodes that are randomly named, each time you connect to a new node, you're adding a new atom to the atom table. So after well, at some time, you can increase that. If you have a lot of structs, the structs fields are also atoms. And also that decode as atom, like, so you can use that for a private API, like, oh, we're not going to change it. But then someone decides to add a metadata, metadata field or have an ID as a key, so then it breaks. Another one that it's not very complicated, but it took me some time to get this right, is linking not just agents, but processes in general. So the concept, the context of that is we have a process, and you want to do some other task in an async way. So you spawn a new process, and when the first one dies, you like the spawn process to die as well. So, well, just link the process. That's what links serve for. So if you have the first pro uh, process dying with an exception, it works. Like the second one dies as well. But if it exits normally, it just ends its task, the other one survives, because that is the expected behavior. So I also wrote a, a code to show that. Um, this spawn function is creating a new module, and in this, in a new process, in this new process, it's spawning a link, waits for a second, and then exits normally. And when you run that, well, first I had 50 process, then I ran that for 10 times, so it would be 10 initial processes and 10 agents, so you get 70. And after a while, you can see that there's 10 more because the initial process, they die, they exit normally, but the agents, they linger on. So if you use that in a production system, after a while, you could have process leakage, just a bunch of agents lingering there. The correct way to do that could be to have a process monitor, because uh, then when you have a process monitor, you receive a message uh, telling that the process you're monitoring has exit, and you have the reason. So it could be a normal, or an exception, or whatever. So this is the way to do it, not just a start link. And now, for me, I need to drink some water, so I have a picture of my rabbit. It's called Little Beast. <laughs> and, well, another one, this is, uh, this is nice. It was a, a bit of a surprise. When we encountered that, call it the case of request monitoring, because we had an API, and for each request, we wanted to track actions that were taken through during that, like a database call, an API call, updating records, publishing to a queue. So we will track that, and if an exception happened and that crashed, we will get those breadcrumbs, all the uh, steps that led to the crash and add that to a exception reporting, right? So what we did was when each request came, the first thing was start an agent and then monitor that agent and the process like I showed before. And then if the initial process exits normally, we just kill the agent. And if it crashes, we'll grab the breadcrumbs from the agent, send the exception, the that for exception monitoring, and then and both. And then we put that in production, and we saw that the number of processes was just increasing and never coming down. And we're a bit confused, like, well, we added the monitor. It's supposed to be working, so what are we doing wrong here? And after a while, then 
hit us. Like, well, we were using Keep Alive. It was an internal service, so most requests came from the same service. And Cowboy reused this process for requests when it's using Keep Alive. And that's why it was happening like that. For each request, we start an agent, and then the initial process uh, serving that request was never killed. So then another request came, we spawned a new agent, and we stay like that, a bunch of agents. So it has a terminate callback that you can use for cleanup. So that's what we used. And continuing on the exception uh, reporting thing, there was also the case of infinite restarts. We were using um, a reporting library that when the process crashed, it created a new reporting task that was under task supervisor. But sometimes the remote API was down. So that meant that the task would uh, time out and then exit. But the task supervisor of this library was using restart transient. And that means that any task that exits from a non-normal exit is going to be restarted. So they were restarted, but the remote API was down. So it just stayed like that. And when we had an issue in production, that meant that the error reporting library would just make things way worse, because then it would just spawn a task for reporting and just keep restarting, and that could lead for the supervisor to restart, and then the whole thing goes down. Well, the fix for that was to change the library and use restart temporary, because uh, reporting the an exception is a non-critical. We'd still like to have the whole the being up if ever it's happened. And oh, finally, I think this is the uh, most interesting case that I'm going to show is the case of messaging router. Uh, the concept we had uh, was building a uh, proof of concept in freelancing gig. And we had a bunch of tracking devices. And all these tracking devices, they communicated via TCP socket to a backend server that would then uh, store messages and have an API so could issue commands for those tracking devices. And the way we implemented the first version, we had a message router. So every message that came from one of the devices would go through this message router that would look up well, whatever gen server was handling that particular device so it could uh, route message where it was supposed to go. And well, we wrote uh, the whole uh, proof of concept, then we started testing, simulating lots of devices, and we realized that with a not very high number of concurrent devices, we ran out of memory. And that also was puzzling. Like, this message routing uh, process did nothing big. It didn't allocate any memory. It just uh, received the message from one of the tracking devices, did a lookup for the gen server, and then called the other gen server. So why wasn't memory being freed? Uh, we knew that that was related to the messages, because we didn't have that many devices, but we did have them sending a lot of messages per second. So then start looking, well, why is that happening? And the lab to, well, the memory layout for a process inside the bin. So for every pro process, there is a process control block that stores metadata, the PID, the name, stuff like that. There is a stack and the private heap where variables and mailbox messages are stored. But there's also a shared heap among all processes inside the bin. And this shared heap is used for what beans call large binaries. Large binaries are anything that is larger than 64 bytes, and that goes to the shared heap. When it goes there, it's called a uh, reference count binary. And when that happens, every process that has a, a pointer to that bi b large binary that pointer is called proc bin and stays in the private heap, and the whole binary is in the shared one. And the thing is that garbage collection for those two types of heaps works differently. 
For the private heap, the garbage collection is generational. So the garbage collection splits the heap in two uh, different sections, one for the young generation for newly allocated data, and the other one for old generation, so it's data that survives uh, a garbage collection for a certain amount of rounds. Because the originality there is that if some data survives a set of garbage collection, that probably means it's data that the process needs for uh, a long time, so it doesn't need to be collected that often. And, well, it divides into these two areas. And then there are two different runs. There's the full sweep, sweep one, that cleans both the young and old generation. And the generational one just cleans up the uh, young part. Now, what happens is when a process starts, it's not going to be garbage collected until its heaps grow past the mean heap size. That is a process flag uh, on Erlang. When it does so, it first runs a full sweep round, because there's no old generation yet. It splits the memory. And then it's going to run the generation one until it either goes past the mean heap size again, or after full sweep after number of runs of the generation one happen. Then for the shared heap garbage collection, it's just reference counting. So whenever a large binary has no reference left, is going to be cleaned. The reference or the proc means that stay in the private heap of processes. So going back to our messaging router uh, thing, what was happening is that the message it was receiving was were large binaries past 64 bytes. So they were went to the shared heap. But since this process didn't use uh, much memory, it wouldn't grow past the mean heap size, so it wasn't being garbage collected. So that meant the, the reference were still there, and the large binaries were never being collected. And that's why it ran out of memory. And to go around that issue, we had three different uh, possibilities. First one was to configure the flag full sweep after to be zero. When you do that, it's going to run a full sweep uh, garbage collection every time. And if you look at the Erlang manual, it actually says to use that if you want large binaries to be garbage collectors as soon as they're not used. Another alternative is to hibernate a process. Once it uh, receives a message, you can uh, in the roughly tell them to hibernate. That's going to run a full sweep GC, then uh, store the process away until it receives a new message. And the third one would be to just stop using a message router and try to do that with a short-lived process. So we spawn a new process with that message. You look up whatever can server is handling that, and then it exits, because then there's no need to run GC. So that was a fun one to figure out. And after all these five cases, I was thinking, well, first, what to do when it happens, and also what I wish I had done prior to the first time this stuff happened, right? So first thing is introspection, because we often talk about how the being is so easily instrumented and how there are uh, many uh, metrics available, but when stuff like this happen in production, you have to be able to connect to the node so you can introspect it. And to do so, you need to give the node a name and set up a cookie, because this way you're going to run the node in a distributed mode. Otherwise, you're just going to run a single node, and there's no way to connect to it. So you, you have to restart it and set up those things and then wait for it to happen again so you can see what's happening. So the first thing is that uh, now I always set a, a set a name and a cookie for all of the nodes that I'm running. So then I can spin up a new one, give it a name, use the same cookie, and then use uh, ran a shade. So when IX starts, it's connected to the node. And then you can use whatever function or module is there to see what's happening. And Talking about seeing what's happening, 
there are some uh, useful functions you can use. There are process lists that can get a PID of all the processes that are running, and then you can use those PIDs to query for process info. Uh, process info just will give you everything related to the process. Uh, what is the heap size, um, how many uh, processes it's connected to, what's, what function is it, is it running, uh, the reduction count, and then for OTP processes like Gen Server, you have the Sys module from Erlang, so you can query for the internal state, you can query for the Gen Server status. So it's really good to figure out what is going wrong with when things go wrong. Another one, if you're still uh, developing that, like that proof of concept I had. Your local machine uh, observer is really good. has a graphical interface that you can explore all this sort of stuff, memory usage, the scheduler usage, uh, CPU, then you can have uh, a tree of all your applications. And if you're able to connect your local machine to the remote node, you can also use it. It's really, really good. But if not, there is the web observer. It's not as much as observer, but it works really well. And it's basically the same thing, but in a web interface. Another one that now I always add to all my projects is Recon. Uh, Recon is a library uh, it's made by Fred Herbert. And it's just a bunch of uh, helper functions that you can use to introspect what's, and know what's what's happening. The one that I use the most is Recon Bing Leak, is to find binary leaks, like the last case. Um, what it does is to return the top end process that release more memory after running a full GC. So what it does is uh, query for the process, get what is the current heap size, then run a full GC, query again, and then show the ones that release the most memory. So if you suspect that there's a process that's, uh, that has dangling uh, process, uh, uh, large binary uh, pointers, then you use that and you can figure out which one's doing that. Another thing is having metrics, because the Bing is indeed highly instrumentable, but if you have somewhere to, where you can see the metrics and the historical metrics, it's better. And there are two that I've used the most is VM stats, that's also with Fred Herbert, and it pushes metrics to stats D. And also we've been using Prometheus uh, for the past six months, and it's great. And the Prometheus integration for both Elixir and Erlang is really good, because you have all of these nice Grafana dashboards that you can just download and configure and you can get really nice graphs for almost everything, like the VM memory, uh, process count, uh, CPU usage, it has integration for Phoenix, so you can have uh, how long a request is taking for different routes, has integration with Acto, with RapGMQ, and a bunch of different and common libraries that we have. So I highly recommend that. The third thing is having visibility of things, like log aggregation. When, when things go wrong, it's very useful to be able to query past logs. If you don't have much traffic or logs, you can just associate into the machine. Go, but in our case, with a distributed uh, infrastructure and servers all over the world, having gray log is a blast, because I love it. And also error reporting. Like once stuff like that happens, I mean it's important that you know it's happening. Uh, there are several ones. Uh, I I think I've used all of them right now. I'm using Bugsnag. I've also Honey Badger has been great. So all of them do almost the same thing, but you can just pick whatever suits you best. And well, the bottom line of that, what I wanted to say is that there are several ways that you can break your Bing systems. So don't go to production without visibility. That's the most important thing. 
and also read Erlang in anger. Because now that we've gone to this point of the talk, I'm going to say that it could have been named, thank you, Fred, you saved my life more than once. You're the best. So <laughs> that's it. It's a really great book. It's very short and to the point, And it tells everything about this, uh, what can go wrong, uh, what you need to pay attention to. And well, really, it's great. So with that, I'd like to say thanks, everyone. Thanks, Fred. And well, thank you for coming here. No, I think nowadays libraries are pretty good. They integrate with uh, uh, Erlang error reporting, so you, you just you get the exception, you get the stack trace, and then if you want, you just need to add some metadata and put stuff there. But libraries are really good. There's nothing special to talk about. It. All right, then. Thanks again.